Hi, I'm Marie Mamad, and welcome to Uni TV, your window into university life. This episode, we get down to the business of business. We have a look at a fantastic scholarship program that helps uni students connect to big companies at the start of their careers. But first, where exactly can a university business degree take you? My name is Naomi Adams and I'm a consultant in the strategy practice at Bruising Company. We work with big businesses to solve strategic problems. An example of what I would do is perhaps work with Qantas and look at their flight schedules and see how we could adjust their flight schedules to increase their customers. Basically I work hand in hand with my Bruising Company colleagues and the client to come up with a solution to the client's problem. What I enjoy most about the job is, you know, the problem solving nature of consulting, so thinking outside the square to come up with a solution to the given problem. Also working with a great range of diverse people is, is fantastic. I got the job at Booze through a, a few things. I undertook some work placements while I was at UNSW as part of the cooperative scholarship program that I was on and I did three work placements which really helped me get to where I am today. My first work placement was for Telstra where I was working on project management in the payphone space. The second placement was with Coca-Cola Amatil. Uh, at Coca-Cola Amatil I was a management accountant essentially and my last placement was at PwC where I worked in insolvency. I think I had a good academic record which was really aided by the fantastic curriculum and staff at UNSW. I chose to study at UNSW over other unis because they really had a reputation for uh, teaching practical degrees rather than sort of more theoretical so it was going to be more useful when I did step out into the real world. Also, UNSW has some great facilities and is a very sort of modern campus which really aided the, the learning experience. There were many highlights of my time at UNSW. Firstly, the great lecturers and tutors really made the learning experience uh, interesting. Secondly, lots of opportunities that I got at UNSW from a university exchange where I went and lived in the UK for six months and studied over there. Um, the great people I met at UNSW from a diverse range of backgrounds and other activities at UNSW that I got, got involved in like clubs and societies and university trips. We get sent away on training trips so I've been to Barcelona for a week of induction training which was fantastic so meeting people from Booz and Company all over the world. I'm Martin and I'm a business IT student studying at the Australian School of Business. This is Fairfax Digital where I'm adding another dimension to my university studies. And I'm Nikki Liu, also a student at the Australian School of Business studying a Bachelor of Commerce. And this is AT Carney, where I too am making the most of an exceptional educational opportunity. We have both embarked on the UNSW Cult program which offers industry-linked scholarships to high achieving students in the fields of business, science, engineering and the built environment. The aim of these scholarships is to place us in real world environments that help us develop into professionals, not just graduates at the end of our university degree. Yep. So this is where I work and this is some of the work that I've been doing actually. This is Richard. As a buddy, he shows me the ropes, makes me feel welcome, and we work alongside each other in this current project. My work has focused on online real estate, and best of all, I've been involved in all stages of the process, from development, product creation, and management, to working in creative services where we focus on functionality and usability. So this is a project that I'm working on at the moment, it's got to do with property data, one of uh, Fairfax Digital's prime products. Um, I'm looking at improving the functionality, usability and presentation of it. As for my day over here at AT Kearney, 
things are shaping up a little differently. I've been working as a management consultant and this involves research into specific industries, financial modelling and analysis and helping to create slides and reports for the client. It's very hands-on and has really helped me to develop important skills in the business management side of my degree. Selected students are recruited into the co-op program when they enter university. The co-op offers a series of opportunities over four years, including professional training development, leadership participation and work experiences like this. As well as being industry linked, the co-op program is a career development scholarship directed at building long-term skills and networks. Over the last three weeks, I've been working on a client project, researching Australia's preference and demand for their product. Today, I'm visiting them to discuss my findings. This has been an amazing experience. I've been able to develop terrific industry contacts. Also, the intellectual variety that comes with the role is very exciting. You never get bored as the type of work you do is constantly changing. So overall, it's been an amazing experience. I've learned so much and it actually has given me insight into what the real world is like and that's what it's all about. Plus, besides the work, I get some free perks. My name is Khan Sevinch and I study BIT, which is Business Information Technology. Information Systems is about um, using technology out there to uh, operate businesses uh, at their optimum level. UNSW is uh, reputable for being among the best universities in Australia. Uh, and the School of Information Systems Technology and Management um, have a lot of research that they publish. Um, both within Australia and worldwide and for that reason I, st I chose UNSW to uh, pursue my degree. I saw it as an opportunity to uh, increase my knowledge in the area and you know get a career in, in IT and you know with IT I know um, I can work anywhere in the world with it. One of the clubs I joined was the Bitsa Club BITS is pretty much an, um, a student association for the ISIT scholars of UNSW and they organise activities and games for the ISIT students um, you know, during their industrial training and just during normal university time so people can socialise and get to, get to see each other, meet each other. I worked at three different companies for six months. Um, we have a bunch of sponsors ranging from IBM to Coca-Cola um, and um, I got to put in my preferences in. I worked for IBM, Westpac and Transfield. Westpac has a new building in the CBD, Sydney CBD, and when, during its construction it was a massive project to sort of create a new image for Westpac, so I was involved with the information technology aspect of that. You know, starting with the networking opportunities, we get to meet people in the industry, which is good um, for future prospects. I'll be working in KPMG as a graduate in the business performance services team. And simply put, they look at business processes and their activities and look at the risks involved. Um, with that and look at ways to improve their performance overall. So having Westpac and IBM on my resume um, really helped me, set, well, really set me ahead of other students um, when I was looking for a job and I can thank UNSW for that. The student experience at the Australian School of Business extends well beyond the classroom. There is a huge range of events and activities on offer, from career days to competition, social and networking events, mentoring opportunities and the chance to hear from distinguished speakers from around the world. Exciting competitions and events are held throughout the year that stimulate and challenge students. Examples include the Reserve Bank Economic Essay Competition, International Marketing Competitions, the JP Morgan Stock Market Challenge and Pitchfest.
Uh, Pitch Fest is an annual event run by the, the ICE Club, which is the Innovation, Commercialisation and Entrepreneurship Club. Pitch Fest is a really fun event because um, it's about three minutes of pitching your, your great business idea, this billion dollar winning uh, idea. I would like you all to imagine this one scenario. Who here likes ice cream? Everyone loves ice cream. So this is my proposal. A flying cup. A flying cup. The Australian School of Business has close ties with the business community. Career events such as the Lucy Mentoring Scheme or the Economic Society Career Day offer terrific opportunities to build professional networks and explore future career options. The USW Economics Careers Day is a very specialised event, so we invite um, 10 employers to come and speak to students. We're at the Economics Society and Careers Day today because we think it's a great opportunity to um, meet keen and intelligent graduates. We're always interested in hearing from them. The Australian School of Business hosts many guest lectures by business leaders and distinguished academics. I did come here at the beginning of February to set up what I think is this brave <coughs> adventure. Social events are an important part of university life and help build a sense of community. Social activities include camps, barbecues, sporting activities and glamour events such as the end of semester ball. not just the formal education you get, it's also the community and a lot of their extracurricular activities. Life skills, business skills, bonding with a good network of people, practicing and a lot of the times it's, it's just building confidence. The confidence to project yourself, um, confidence to know that you're going to succeed and confidence to, to go after those, those dreams that you have and do the things that other people are scared to do. It's an unfortunate fact of modern life that much of what underpins the growth and development of our economies is also contributing to the potentially dire levels of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. If humanity is to avoid what most experts believe will be a global, environmental, economic and social disaster, then we'll have to rapidly reduce the output of these gases. But stopping emissions without stopping the economy is a complex proposition and is proving to be something far easier said than done. Dr Regina Betts is a leading academic in the field of emissions trading, dedicating herself to searching for economic solutions to our environmental woes. So our research focuses on the design of an emissions trading scheme. We are covering three areas. The first area is um, auctioning, how to auction emission permits. Our recommendations have actually been included in the green paper um, on the carbon pollution scheme. Um, our second area is looking at how to link different emissions trading schemes globally. We looked at New Zealand, Australia particularly. And the third um, area is looking at the enforcement um, compliance regime, so how to design penalties. The whole system is geared to put a market-driven dollar value on the cost of pollution. Professor Roger Simnett is the head of the University of New South Wales School of Accounting. Although these problems exist in the natural world, it has to be the business world that plays a vital role in solving them. I think in the first place that, you know, we've, we've got all these scientific, hopefully the scientific developments which are taking in place. We have to make sure they're credible, so they have to be reported properly so that people can have a look at these and make imp uh, informed decisions. And that's where the accounting comes in, uh, so that for either internal parties, for, you know, for management within organisations, uh, or for external parties, you know, such as government and society and shareholders and other stakeholders, uh, that we have the right information for those informed decisions. So business is coming to us to know what they need to do and um, we tell them there are about three things which are important for, for each company. 
to know before emissions trading starts. One is what, where the emissions are and what the projections are of the emissions in the future. The second is what the technology options are. So how much does it cost and what kind of options do they have to reduce emissions internally? And the third thing is then to come up with a strategy to actually decide if they're going to reduce their emissions internally or if they are going to buy permits on the market. Trading schemes aim to provide a practical and economic incentive for big business to do the right thing. Uh, a lot of nations have been doing their own thing as far as the reporting, uh, the financial reporting is, and we've now got an international comparison there, uh, international accounting standards in place. Uh, I'd like to see the same in, in the area of carbon emissions, that we have an international standard in place uh, and uh, that we uh, can place some international assurance on those particular areas. What I'd like to achieve um, is that we see an emissions trading scheme which is fair and equitable and at the same time will deliver emission reductions to the atmosphere. Regardless of how carefully we tread, the short-term economic costs of adapting to and curbing the impact of climate change are likely to be substantial. The cost of delay, however, even for a brief period, could be immense. I'm Susie Hamilton and with me on the couch is Dr Simon Resterborg. He's from the Australian School of Business at UNSW. Simon, you work in a very interesting area. You look at the dark side of organisations and yes, organisational behaviour. I think that includes bullying. Can you tell me exactly what you mean by the dark side? Well, the dark side actually focuses primarily on the bad behaviors, you know, exemplified by employees and their supervisors in the workplace. It may cover, you know, topics such as bullying, which can either be lateral, you know, between two co-workers. It can also be about abusive supervision, where, you know, you have a, sub, uh, a, a supervisor who's actually undermining a subordinate. It can also be about revenge, you know, aiming to hurt or threaten the well-being of another employee. So it can cover all these different constructs and you know, behaviours. How commonplace is it? I mean, we hear a lot in the media about bullying. Is it we, just that we have a, a heightened awareness about it, or is it commonplace? I think, you know, I would probably draw your attention to a survey that's been conducted by the Australian Council of Trade Unions back in 2000, in which they found that nearly 70% of employees had been mistreated by their supervisors. So it's pretty common. So was the idea that you wanted to make a difference and actually impact organizations and try to improve that? Well, apart from making a difference, I want to help organizations curb out these behaviors, that these behaviors actually threaten the well-being, not only of the employees, and also the productivity of the organization itself. So by doing this research, it would allow companies and organizations to establish some mechanisms to actually minimize these behaviors. Let's talk about some of the specifics of the papers that you've written. Um, one is on anger displacement, I believe. Yes. What is that and what did you find? Um, so the, t the title of the paper is actually very interesting because I titled it as When Distress Hits Home. So that is basically the title of the paper. Uh, anger displa displacement is a mechanism in which a person tries to redirect his or her anger to an alternative source. So, for example, if I am a subordinate and I have actually been scolded by my supervisor, I cannot direct my anger to the source of my frustration because I am likely to expect that there are ramifications if I do that. So what happens is that I, as the person who's actually experienced being abused or being scolded at, is more likely to redirect my anger onto another in innocent party. So, for example, a coworker or, say, a family member or, for example, my partner. Mm -hmm. So that illustrates the concept of anger displacement. How commonplace is that? 
I think you, you see this even in the popular press. You know, last year I was reading this newspaper and I saw this cartoon strip, you know, which illustrates this concept specifically, where a boss scolded the subordinate. The subordinate got home, got frustrated towards the wife. The wife got frustrated also and scolded the son, and the son kicked the dog. So that clearly illustrates, you know, of course, in a humorous fashion, the notion of anger displacement. There's been a whole lot of awareness about um, bullying, as we've said. Um, do people act, why do people do it? Is it because they just don't know how to uh, manage themselves in a different fashion? Is it as simple as that? In the organizational literature, there are basically two common explanations why bullying or abusive supervision actually happens or occurs. One explanation takes from the perspective of justice. If I am a supervisor, for example, and I have been mistreated by my own supervisor, I am more likely to displace my aggression or frustration to another person. And usually the victim is a subordinate. Okay, so that is a situational explanation to why abusive supervision or bullying occurs. Another explanation is from the perspective of personality. You know, some people are prone to anger. Some people are more likely to feel frustrated. Some people are more likely to experience negative emotional states. That's why they tend to be, you know, aggressive towards others. So I know that you said earlier that part of your work you feed it to organizations and the idea is that they need to provide leadership. Do they need to target certain people in organizations or does it need to be across the board? I don't think, you know, supervisors will volunteer to attend a leadership training if they actually frame it as, you know, in, um, making sure that they're not abusive towards sub their subordinates. So I would use the approach that I usually suggest to organizations is making, making it across the board that everyone who takes a supervisory role in terms of supervising others should make sure that these people are given the you know, strategies and the practical skills in order for them to manage their employees very well. And that includes you know, treating them with respect, treating them with dignity. But what do you do when you're in an organization and somebody is being a bully? How do you personally um, navigate a situation like that? Well, the first step to do is to actually acknowledge that bullying is occurring, okay? And to make sure that that person is aware that he or she is being bullied. That's the first step. The second step is to allow that person to actually speak out, and you know, especially for the victim, about how he or she feels about the situation. And the next step would be not directly to confront the bully, well, some people do confront them, but it may actually lead to more negative ramifications. You know, at times what happens is that the situation gets to be more aggravated. So what I usually suggest is that if the organization has mechanisms or grievance procedures, then that is the way to go, to actually write it up and you know, elevate the concern to the immediate manager or to the HR person. Simon, thank you so much. No worries. Gone are the days of business being a pure money-making exercise. Today's smart business graduates want more. They want to make a difference to the world they live in. And so, at UNSW's Australian School of Business, the Social Endeavour Prize competition was born. This is launch night. The Social Endeavour Prize has been assembled as a device to help the student community understand the not-for-profit sector. So specifically, we have a competition where 10 teams of four students are married up to a charity, and they will compete with the best fundraising concept. Tonight, the competing students will absorb some words of wisdom. I hope that for those of you participating in the Social Endeavor Prize, that the experience will challenge you and open your eyes to the opportunities within the not-for-profit sector and also the important role that it plays in the Australian community. I leave you with a favourite saying of mine from the poet Goethe, whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power and magic in it. The students are also here to network. They have just 35 minutes to meet the charity representatives, gather face-to-face -face information and make that all-important first impression. I'm at this uh, Social Endeavour Prize launch because um, this is exactly what I want. Um, I believe it's going to give me the consulting skills that I need and I believe it will be able to give me the opportunity to actually apply what I know at university to a social project which will um, provide a greater impact in our society. I've come here tonight to, to meet some people, get some ideas and also ask you know, um, 
these organisations that have come along tonight, you know, how how they go about you know, getting in income streams, you know, where do they come from, the various um, the ways they go about making money, you know, to, to then feed that out to the people who are in need. At Wayside, we're extraordinarily reliant on funding for our operations because only 30% of our funding is from government. So nights like this actually get us together with innovative thinkers who could come up with ideas that would um, help with our operational funding. I've had the opportunity to meet these two men tonight. We've clicked. I think we're going to come up with some fantastic ideas together and um, we'll get to it. So anyway. So what was your idea with the... The students now have six weeks to shape up their pitches, taking their socially innovative learning outside the classroom and into real-world endeavours. Well, that's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. This is Mary Mammoth, and I'll see you next time on UniTV.